Hello and welcome. I'm Nicole Budjovich, Curatorial Assistant in the Antiquities Department at the Getty Villa in Los Angeles. And the Getty is located on the ancestral unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of this land. We respect and honor the deep history of this region. Today, I'm joined by Charles Stocking, Associate Professor of Classics at Western University in Ontario, Canada. Charles is a specialist in ancient sport and also a former strength and conditioning coach for UCLA Athletics. So Charles and I are looking forward to discussing the object you can see here on your screen, a mosaic of two boxers and a bowl that once decorated a Roman villa in Southern France. And we're both fascinated by this object, but for different reasons. And before diving into exactly what it shows, I just wanted to ask Charles when he first encountered this piece and why it interests him. Yeah, thanks so much, Nicole. And uh, thanks, I'd like to thank the Getty uh, and everybody uh, involved in uh, this art break. It's been a really exciting uh, project. And um, yeah, so this piece is actually something very close to me. Uh, and one of my favorite pieces to teach when I teach ancient sport, I have a sort of personal connection to it for two reasons. I first encountered this piece very young, well before uh, doing my PhD at UCLA. And um, the reason is, well, one of the reasons it's always fascinated me is because my father was a boxer. And so I grew up with stories of boxing and I could even see the sort of physical marks of, you know, this violent sport on my father. And so seeing this, uh, seeing this boxer mosaic when I was young sort of made me really fascinated with ancient sport. And then, as you mentioned, while in graduate school, I was also a strength and conditioning coach at UCLA, uh, sort of moonlighting as a coach while getting my PhD in classics. And what this has uh, allowed me to do is really give me a firsthand experience and I have a lot of expertise in training physical bodies. Um, and as far as the ancient world is concerned, I like to think of my time as a coach, as a sort of ethnographic field work in physical culture, just because ancient athletics was such a vital component of, uh, of the ancient world. And so having that firsthand experience really has opened my eyes to a lot of different avenues. And so I'm really excited to talk about this mosaic today. Um, and I, sh I should admit, though, that when I, often when I teach this mosaic, I talk about it from more generic terms and not really with regard to the specifics. Um, so, Nicole, if you could sort of uh, maybe share with the audience the specifics of, this, uh, of the mosaic, I think that would be really fascinating uh, for the audience as well. Yeah, totally. Um, let's take a closer look. So first, I want to just show this gallery view. My, I first encountered this mosaic actually in a gallery tour at the Getty Villa. And it was a very formative tour because it brought up all these great questions, planted the seed of interest. And here you can see it on view in the gallery at the time. And just to give a sense of scale, it's six by six feet, would have been on a floor, but here it's on a wall. Um, and yeah, I'll give a quick recap of what's depicted in the mosaic, but some notes that I won't be able to touch on, like its provenance and excavation history, super fascinating. We'll drop links to those in the chat. So, but yes, to get to the mosaic, so here they are, <laughs> a more of a detail shot. And this isn't just any boxing match, but actually a specific scene from Roman literature and known as the boxing match of Darius and Antellus. And it's a famous episode from Virgil's Aeneid. It would have been recognizable by Romans since the Aeneid was a foundational text that was widely read and studied and even performed. And what's the Aeneid, just some background. It follows the Trojan prince Aeneas who's journeying from Troy to Italy to found Rome but he stops off in Sicily to hold funeral games for his father. And this is where the boxing match takes place. And just for reference, the mosaic was found in Southern France in this near the modern town of Villar, which is marked with the red pin. So in the, according to Virgil, Aeneas announces the match, offers a bull as a prize. Dares, a young Trojan in his company, who's a skilled boxer, claims he's unbeatable. And that's until Entellus, an old retired boxer and local Sicilian, challenges the young upstart. And so Virgil dedicates over a hundred lines of poetry to this, this dramatic fight. And against all odds, Entellus beats Darius. And in a final display of his strength, Entellus turns and with one blow crushes the skull of the bull that he's won. And here you can see him flexing. Darius is also is bleeding and the bull is bleeding out in the background. And before getting into this bloody scene, just, let's see, yes, um, the, a bit of local context, I mentioned it was found in Southern France, so the provinces, but it was very Romanized by the second century when this mosaic dates to. And you can see Villar, it was actually a countryside villa, but 
50 miles from Aix en Provence, modern Aix, where there would have been amphitheaters and even today preserved in nearby cities. You have theaters, temples, arenas. So there was a lot of Roman <laughs> built up around. And interestingly, this scene seems to be popular in the region with three other mosaics found at least all from Aix en Provence. Um, and here they are just to give a sense of comparison. They have the same composition, maybe the same workshop. And oddly enough, these are the only known or some of the only known representations of this boxing match from the ancient world. So there was some local popularity in Roman literature, um, but also boxing. And also with all these mosaics on the same screen, a few things stand out to me. Their impressive boxing gloves, their nudity, and the excessive blood that's featured in each of them. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just, and now turning back to kind of more generally, I was wondering how this very specific representation of boxers from literature fits with the real world of boxing and sport. Yeah, so thank you, Nicole. The, um, that's a really great background. The, uh, at the same time that this portrays a specific event, it also captures a lot of the general aspects of ancient boxing. Um, the first thing to notice, of course, is the fact of nudity that you mentioned that distinguishes it from modern boxing. Now, all of ancient athletics uh, in, in the Greek and Roman world was practiced in the nude. Um, and of course, the, the word for gymnasium, our word for gym, comes from the Greek word gumnos, which means to be naked. Now, why precisely the ancient athletes practiced in the nude were not entirely, or competed in the nude, we're not entirely sure. There are a lot of different theories. One thing is for certain, though, the act of uh, competing naked provides a sort of element of literal exposure, but also exposure to, gen to danger in general. And so that sort of shows a certain vulnerability that all of the athletes have as they are about to uh, perform uh, these athletic in these athletic contests. Now, the other fact about boxing, there's a couple other features. It was much more brutal than modern boxing. Even though modern boxing is brutal, uh, the ancient was more so. Uh, first off, there were no rounds in ancient boxing. So, and uh, boxing matches ended either by uh, one person quitting or by knockout, or sometimes a judge could also end uh, end a uh, fight prematurely. But boxing matches were said to uh, have gone sometimes entire days uh, because of this. So it's an extremely tough sport. And then lastly, um, not just not just the uh, endurance component, but there's also the sheer violence of it that's related to the boxing gloves themselves. Uh, these boxing gloves, unlike modern boxing gloves, were not designed to protect oneself and one's opponent, but were actually designed to inflict more damage. They were made of leather straps that were strapped around the wrist and they would actually uh, cause more damage to the skin. They would lacerate the skin, cause more damage. So the whole purpose of boxing in this case was not really to limit the amount of brutality, but to um, exercise it and to sort of exacerbate it. And that's portrayed here, of course, uh, with Antella's bleeding from his skull as well. But with regard to this particular uh, scene from boxing, there are many other representations. One of my favorite is the Terme boxer, uh, the seated boxer. And I thought, Nicole, maybe you could uh, talk to our audience a little bit about this particular piece, which I think is really magnificent. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I guess that gives such great context for just how violent the scene seems in Virgil, but really ancient athletics, it was just that violent and bloody. And here we have this great detail of the gloves on the Terme boxer, this Hellenistic bronze sculpture that shows a seated boxer who clearly is, a, he's gloves give that sense of the weighted iron, the straps, and I think, yeah, the violence of it is very apparent. And I also want to just share a detail of his face, which gives a sense of how violent this was. Where you, he has cauliflower ears, cuts and lacerations. It's, yeah, and modern reconstructions by Brinkmann, these are pretty recent, give a sense of the original polychromy that would have uh, enlivened the piece. So you really could see him, the bruise swelling, and it's just super violent. And um, yeah, it's interesting, this this would is probably what a lot of people, most of you maybe are familiar with this piece, and just gives a sense of this idea of boxing as this visceral, violent thing. And here, there's also, <laughs> I want to bring up that we don't know who this boxer is. There's a lot of great interpretations as to who, whether he's from myth or reality, um, but his identity is unknown, and whether he's victorious or defeated is unknown. And just turning back to our boxers and how that plays into their representation in art, we know exactly who's victorious here, right? It's uh, Antellus, he's flexing, Darius is bleeding out. Um, yeah, it's very clear. And I think 
also the bull in the background and which I haven't mentioned, but I, it's a strange and violent thing to happen at the end of this match, this punctuated killing of the bull. And I wonder how that, yeah, if you wanted to share how that fits into ancient sport. Yeah, the bull is a sort of fascinating feature here because uh, all of ancient athletics was in fact part of religious festivals in honor of gods. And the primary uh, aspect of the religious worship of ancient Greek and Roman gods was animal sacrifice. Now, as part of that sacrifice of the animal, a portion of it would be burned uh, for uh, the gods, and then a portion would also be given to victorious athletes. And this actually relates to the very beginnings of ancient sport, going all the way back to ancient Olympia. Um, and this actually, uh, I think, can be seen in another slide, this next one. Here, of course, we have just one uh, sort of more generic image of a torch race, uh, but the torch race itself relates to the origins of the Olympics. According to an ancient author, Philostratus, the beginnings of the Olympics first started with what's called the stadion, a 200 meter race, and it was a race to the altar. And whoever was the victor was the person who got to light the altar for the sacrificial victim. Uh, and then as a consequence of that, also the athlete would get to take part in the sacrificial meat. So this idea of athletes taking part in the sacrifice means they really get to take part in what, what is otherwise reserved uh, for the gods. So there's this semi-divine component uh, to, uh, or a divine association with athletic victors. But what about the converse? What does this say about the losers? Because the victor was, uh, was associated with the sacrificer, uh, the loser was associated with the sacrificial victim often. Uh, and so there's this dominant cultural metaphor in the ancient world between uh, victors as sacrificers and uh, losers as sacrificial victims. And I think the best place that captures this goes back all the way to Homer's Iliad uh, in one particular episode. Now in this episode, the hero Achilles is chasing the Trojan prince Hector around the walls of Troy. And that race is actually compared to uh, an athletic contest, to a running race. Uh, and Homer says here in this particular passage, a good man ran in front, ran out in front, but a far better man pursued eagerly. It was not for a sacrificial ox that the two were striving, the sort that are prizes won by men with their feet. No, they were running for the life of horse taming Hector. So in this case, Hector is literally running for his life, but his life there is sort of understood as a substitute for the sacrificial ox. And here's this particular image too of the aftermath of that sort of uh, mortal race for Hector's life. Achilles kills Hector in the end. And here you see in this image the, at the bottom, uh, the body of Hector uh, underneath the table of Achilles. And on top of the table are strips of meat. And there is Achilles reclining on his couch, licking his knife. So the assumption, there's a large implication of cannibalism here that goes along perfectly with this episode from Homer, talking about uh, Hector as the equivalent of a sacrificial victim. And in this case, Achilles, the winner of that race, is also in some sense, both the sacrificer and by implication, there's an element of cannibalism as well. So this is a really interesting dynamic, I think, that sort of compares and that can be very different from modern sport, where we talk a lot about, you know, needing to sacrifice, uh, you know, oneself in order to win. But in the ancient world, it was the victor who was the one who had to sacrifice the loser, essentially. And Maybe of course, yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead, Nicole. No, no, just that what you said, that they became the object of sacrifice. They are the bull now, which is just, anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, so there's a real interesting difference there between uh, modern sport and ancient. And of course, in the case of boxing, this violent aspect that's implicit in the larger cultural context is really obvious because boxing itself is so absolutely violent. And it's not just about racing in this case, but it's really about inflicting pain on uh, the other athlete. And of course, death could uh, possibly result from this. Uh, there's one particular uh, literary episode that really captures that. Uh, and this is a sort of precursor to Virgil's Aeneid, which is a boxing match between uh, Pollux and Amicus. And this comes from an uh, Hellenistic epic, Apollonius's Argonautica. Now in this boxing match, Amicus challenges uh, Pollux, And during the episode, Apollonius provides this one particular line. He says, Amicus stretched out like a man about to slay an ox and swung his weighted hand down upon Polydeuces, that's Pollux. So here, Amicus is equated to the sacrificer. Now, of course, in the bout, Pollux uh, dodges the blow 
and ends up being the one that defeats Amicus. But the metaphor there becomes, uh, becomes more than obvious, right? That the victor is the sacrificer. So yeah, and you, yeah. that's, a, that's a sort of background uh, to the sort of idea of athletics, sport, and sacrifice. Right. That's from that goes all the way back to the origins of the Olympics. But I think one thing to, to think about, and perhaps Nicole, you can uh, talk about this some more, is how this relates specifically to the Roman context and how would the Romans have received this image and how does that relate more specifically to Virgil? Totally. Yeah. And I think while these while the amicus scene is on the screen, I'll move on. But the, the fact that he is defeated and is killed right in the match, unlike with our boxers, the Entelus, he doesn't actually kill Darius. And I think the language too, I love that you picked that out because we have the same thing happening in Virgil. He's clearly looking at Apollonius and kind of quoting him. And when at the end of the match, after he's bloody Darius, he, as you, Aeneas steps in actually to end the match because he's worried he's going to, Entelus is going to kill Darius. End of the match, he says, you've won, give it up. <laughs> and that's when, I love this line, uh, Entelus turned full front, front to the bowl and drawing back his right hand, po poison, <laughs> poison the dread ax high, swung sheer between the horns and crushed the skull. So here again, we have his gloved hand, which is weighted with this serious glove, equated to the ax, the sacrificial ax, but he's killing the bull. He's not doing the barbaric thing of killing Darius. And I think it's interesting, yeah, through the Roman lens, the Virgil is trying to kind of build on this Greek tradition, but make it a new Roman story um, but clearly still wanting to retain the showmanship and kind of epicness of the scene. They're nude. It's, it's a traditional boxing match. Um, and yeah, and I think that, that kind of larger than life showmanship that Entelus displays, but also extreme violence combined, I, I feel it might collect, connect to modern sport, but I wonder how, how you think of this in relation to modern sport. Yeah, I mean, obviously uh, boxing is still extremely violent today. And even though we don't necessarily, you know, we or we don't uh, have sacrifice animal sacrifices at sporting events. I think there's still an implication there, and especially when it comes to cannibalism. And here, you know, I thought we could share one of my favorite quotes uh, from nearly all of modern sport. This is a quote from Mike Tyson after uh, beating a particular opponent and asking about his upcoming fight with Lennox Lewis. Uh, and I'll just read you. Uh, actually, I want to read the end of the quote first when he says, there's no one that can match me. My style is impetuous. My defense is impregnable and I'm just ferocious. I want his heart. I want to eat his children. So there, of course, Mike Tyson gives full expression to that, um, that desire or that cannibalistic uh, implication that's part of uh, both ancient and modern boxing. And of course, uh, Mike Tyson famously made this uh, more than obvious when he bit the ear of Evander Holyfield. And also, even uh, in the fight for Lennox Lewis, there was a fight that broke out in the press conference. And apparently, uh, according to some reports, Mike Tyson had actually bitten Lennox Lewis as well. So, <laughs> so there's some real, uh, so there is, of course, this interesting visceral and embodied way in which uh, these, this uh, cannibalistic desire becomes both a part of ancient boxing and modern boxing. But I think what's also really important about Mike Tyson's quote is the beginning where he says, I'm the best ever, I'm the most brutal and vicious and most ruthless champion there's ever been. So again, an uh, emphasizing that. And then he says, there's no one can stop me. Lennox is a conqueror. No, I'm Alexander. He's no Alexander. I'm the best ever. There's never been anybody as ruthless. I'm Sonny Liston, I'm Jack Dempsey. There's no one like me. So the other interesting part here, part of uh, Mike Tyson's quote is the ways in which Mike Tyson connects himself to history, right? He's actually referring to Alexander the Great in this case. Uh, and then he also connects himself to modern boxing history, saying that he's Sonny Liston and Jack Dempsey. So there's this way in which boxing and nearly and all ancient sports, as well as modern, there's a way in which the practice of the sport also connects one physically to a sort of embodied history of the past. And that's, that's true in the ancient world. And Nicole, I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about how that relates, or that's true in the modern world. Perhaps you could talk about how that relates to the ancient world as well. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think you yeah, have this quote where he's making himself out to be Alexander and I, the, the bodies and the training of them is something that comes up with how the Romans considered boxing a Greek sport, but they kind of adopted it into the Roman athletics and just giving a sense of that difference between what Romanness means. Here we have, I think the Darius and Antilus 
figures are very Roman in their form. Their bodies are meant to be boxing bodies. They're physically designed for, you know, they're very top heavy. And it's very similar to these amazing mosaics from the Baths of Caracalla in Rome that are decorated a athletic, potentially athletic training space. And um, here you can see they're realistic. They're not idealized. It's their bodies are functional. And I think the Romans were building on this Greek tradition of training and athletics, but making it <laughs> more their own. It, me it had to be functional versus, and I think if you want to talk about this too, but the, the kind of idealized Greek bodies as uh, perfect ideals of perfection or symmetria. Yeah, you can, you can really see the difference at the Baths of Caracalla was something like uh, the Duriferous by Polyclitus, which of course is meant to represent this concept of symmetria or perfect balance compared to these other bodies, which are, you know, they're certainly fit, but you know, they don't have perfect body proportion. So when I teach ancient sport, I like to think about the difference between say an athlete and a fitness model, right? Fitness models are there and they look good aesthetically uh, as opposed to athletes whose body proportions may not necessarily be ideal, right? Or they may not have perfect body, super low body fat percentages, et cetera. And the point there is the functionality. So I think it's really interesting that um, the Baths of Caracalla athletes very look very similar to the Darius and Entellus uh, image as well. So there's that interesting connection. I guess another thing to think about, of course, is the Baths of Caracalla are, um, of course, a sporting context. Athletes would have been training at the Baths and then seeing these images. But what about the uh, specific fine context or the ancient context? I should say not the fine context, but the ancient context for this particular mosaic of Darius and Entellus. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, and actually this is where my interest in it really is founded because I'm coming at it more from an art historical side. So it's great to hear your sport, boxing, the Greek tradition, that whole background. But I'm my interest was always was more on how was this mosaic received by the people who saw it originally. And we know this decorated a dining room in a Roman villa in the countryside. And here's just a kind of modern reconstruction to give a sense of how that might have looked. And but un so unlike those Baths of Caracalla mosaics where you're training your body, seeing these beautiful, you know, these idealized or practical bodies on the ground. Uh, here, this is definitely a space of spectacle. Like you're hosting guests, the, the guests arrive and they see this scene on the ground. You're not trying to aspire to that in that moment. It's more about referencing Virgil or maybe just referencing the scene from Epic, right? And I think that idea of it, and here again, you can see it's would have not, you would have walked on it and dragged chairs across it. It was very functional, but it was still the focus of the floor. And maybe it was served as a springboard for talking about Roman literature, but also, again, their bodies are very Roman with their stocky kind of their proportions. So it could have also brought up ideas or memories of going to local athletic events or training. So it's kind of doing all this at the same time. And yeah, I think <laughs> this gives a sense too of just how that tradition, and I like to think of how this scene was received in antiquity but also boxing in general and how the history that continues, right? Where what happens in the modern times with <laughs> boxing sporting events as these giant spectacles, not just on floors, but in, yeah, how do we, how does the 20th century kind of connect to this? Yeah, absolutely. The, um, what's so fascinating too, of course, uh, ancient Greeks, right? Even elites would have had practice in boxing and probably would have been boxers. Whereas by the time we get to the time of Rome, there is really a class division between those who own the villas with these mosaics versus those who are the actual boxers. So you see a real class division and this development of spectacle around that where you have elites as the spectators for these violent sports and perhaps lower class athletes as the performers. And that's certainly true in the case of modern history, right? With the history of boxing, which is very much modern boxing, which is very much associated with the working class. And yet it has always bought, brought in uh, huge amounts of money and large spectator, um, large uh, amounts of uh, spectators. I think there's a great example of this, uh, which is in the next slide. Uh, this is a painting, uh, an etching from uh, the early 20th century by a figure named Bellows, who is famous for his portrayal of boxing. Uh, and in this case, uh, what's so fascinating about this uh, particular portrayal, right, is that there's an emphasis not on the boxers. He normally does emphasize the boxers in a lot of the detail, but in this case, there's an emphasis on the spectators and clearly the wealth of the spectators. You can see all the top hats in the audience as opposed to what's happening in the ring. Um, and perhaps I think what's really uh, most fascinating about this particular one is the woman looking back, 
right? So in this particular image, this woman looking back is looking at us uh, who would either be in the audience as spectators. And so it's making us aware of our own enjoyment of violent uh, spectator sport, right? And it sort of brings this sort of meta artistic level to uh, the scene to make us think about what does it mean to be a spectator of violent sport? Um, so that's something that I think is very much a part of the ancient world, uh, a part of the modern world, but we can perhaps see that um, in the uh, Darius and Intellis mosaic as well. Uh, what do you think, Nicole? Yeah, no, no, exactly. And I think this really captures that idea of we are, the as the mosaic decorated the floor, it would have been a space of display and spectacle for the elite homeowners, but lots of people would have seen it. And I think the bellows really captures the idea of making that into art, the whole scene, the spectators. And even with our Darius and Tellus, and Tellus is also looking out at us, right? He, just like the woman in the bellows, he's kind of looking back a little bit at Darius maybe, but also he's in our plane. He's very much with the viewer. And I think that address, it kind of invites you as a spectator to really engage with this question of what does it mean to in, take pleasure and enjoy this brutal violence of boxing and sport as high art? And yeah, I think that really, that paradox is still there in antiquity as it is in the 20th century. Absolutely. I mean, it really does make us think about uh, what does boxing mean as art and, and, and sport as art. So yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and I realized this is, oh man, this is so great. And we have some questions coming in. So I'm conscious of time. So maybe let's turn it over to questions. Great. Um, one moment. Yeah, this is. Let's see, I can't seem to pull up my questions. Okay, we have. Oh, there we go. We have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. All right, so uh, David Saunders asks a great question, which is the age difference between the two fighters seems the central aspect of Virgil's account but it doesn't seem that obvious in the mosaic. Both men seem to be bearded. Why do you think that is? Um, yeah, so um, thank you, David. I think that's a great, question, a great question. I mean, there is of course the age difference. And at the same time, uh, the other thing to think about perhaps antiquity versus modernity is age and appearance versus age and ability. Um, there's an assumption in the ancient world, of course, that, and the Darius and Intellis uh, episode portrays this, that uh, older generations are actually more physically superior. Uh, and why is this? Because they're in a generation that's closer to the gods. And so the ancient world had this idea of degeneration uh, as, you know, which meant that younger athletes were not as physically fit as older athletes per se. This, this episode from Darius and Intellis uh, has a parallel in the case of Odysseus as well who uh, of course is of a much uh, older generation, but even in the, uh, in the games, the funeral games of Patroclus uh, sort of outperforms everybody, even though he's part of the older generation. And the same thing happens in the Phaeacian games. So perhaps the, the idea that they are represented as though they look of equal age emphasizes the fact that older athletes can and were superior in antiquity. This idea that because why because they're actually closer to this earlier generation, that's that's one way to think about it. But David, I think that's a great question. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm picking out a. I found a question about the reconstruction, asking about how the orientation of the floor mosaic. Unfortunately, don't know <laughs> the so, and I don't want to go back to the slide. But basically, how would that mosaic been viewed? Would it been viewed when you walk into the room? seeing the boxers right there, or would it have prioritized the view from the couches? And this person in the questions rightly pointed out, it probably would have prioritized the view from the couches <laughs> so that while you're sitting at it, you're watch looking at the mosaic as if you're watching the scene play out. Um, and I think in the reconstruction, it's not, so it doesn't convey that, but that's a great question. Just really thinking of how these pieces were experienced by the viewers. And also I wanna just, oh yeah. I'm conscious of time, so we're going to keep answering questions, even sure, though I just yeah. saw 1230, but hopefully everyone can stay on. Really, thank you for joining us, but yeah, we're going to keep, there's so many great questions that came in, so we're going to keep going through those, but um, yeah, if you had one to go for, Charles. Yeah, absolutely. There's another great question here by an anonymous attendee uh, that, could you say something about Roman boxing as a gladiatorial sport in contrast to the more honorable athletic competitions? That's a great, uh, a great question. Um, that question is uh, sort of centers around this real difference that happens 
as we move from the Greek era to the Roman era. Now, uh, Greek style boxing persisted in the Roman era as well. And of course the Olympics and all of the events uh, continued in the Roman era and boxing itself did take on a spectacle side, right? It wasn't actually the same as gladiatorial combat, but it was in fact used athletic events, Greek style athletic events were treated as a sort of sideshow or intermittent show in larger spect uh, spectacle events like gladiatorial combat uh, and chariot racing. So uh, it still did take on that spectacle component. And so there is a real difference uh, in that regard. And why is this? Part of this relates to the fact that Rome conquered Greece and now Greece is sort of the vassal state and Greek athletes would then become performers and not necessarily, and so it wasn't integrated in the same way in Roman community as it was Greek. So that's sort of how we have this transition. It still took on a, a lot of significance. Why? Because uh, Greek athletics was also part of Greek education, which was associated with uh, elite education in the Roman era, but nevertheless, it still has that spectacle component. So uh, hopefully that answered your question uh, on the difference between Greek style athletics uh, versus uh, Roman spectacle uh, related to boxing. And tying that to the mosaic, Charles, it's interesting that I didn't quite get into it, but the area of Southern France is super Romanized, obviously, but it's also a melting pot. It had Greek settlements very early on. Uh, modern Marseille was a Greek settlement. So it was actually quite early in the Roman uh, Republic and other periods, it was a destination for Greek education for in the West of sorts. And so I think how much that awareness of that Greek history plays into that local context is up for debate. But I think, yeah, it's, it's nuanced and complex. <laughs> um, and yeah, great questions. I think, and also speaking of the Southern France context, we have a question from Ken asking if the mosaics also from Axe, how did they share these compositions? And did they have pattern books? And did this scene appear in other mos media beyond mosaics? And just to quickly answer that, it's a quite a rare scene. There's one relief that shows it. There's other scenes from Virgil and notably those are all generally in the provinces. So North Africa, in the UK or in Britain. Um, and the, but this scene is pretty rare. And there's another version of it from Arl that features Aeneas, a mosaic. And as far as how these circulated, I think the theory right now is that there were pattern books. Of course, these don't survive today. And so certain elements of the three mosaics are very similar, but also some different. So some scholars have tried to work at a timeline. One was by the master workshop. Another was maybe someone saw it and commissioned it for their home because they wanted something similar. And again, the question of why they wanted this, not obscure, but very specific Roman literary scene is, is interesting and definitely plays into the history of boxing in the region, perhaps. Um, and yeah. Yeah, there's, an, there's another great question here by uh, Tom Ernest. He asks, uh, how close uh, were the depictions of sport on mosaics and vases, even from mythology to the actual competitions in real life at the time. So yeah, so the question is, um, how much did the ancient mythic and act other art depictions reflect actual practice? Now, if I had some other vases here, I could show you that, in fact, it seems to be the case that ancient uh, painters and those who were and these different forms of art were very familiar with uh, the biomechanics of ancient sport. Uh, if we think about um, images, for instance, of sprinters on Greek vases, they actually portray perfect sprinting form, right? They, there's a four foot strike, right? Meaning so they're not running heel toe, there's knee drive. There's all these uh, technical components to sprinting. Sprinting is not necessarily natural. It's a learned technical uh, sport. Um, and all of these different technical components are perfectly captured on Greek vases, such as Panathenaic Amphoros. So I think there's a way in which um, they were very familiar with the actual practices of sport. And so even though we have mythic accounts, those mythic accounts were not entirely separate or totally uh, you know, uh, foreign to the actual practice. There's a very strong degree of realism, uh, both uh, or stylized realism, I should say, uh, insofar as they were depicting actual technique and, and genuine knowledge of these ancient sports. So that's a great question. Yeah. And yeah, another question from Vince about the, and this connects to your question, your uh, discussion of sacrifice and the how the bull plays into it. He asks, uh, where, where this mosaic was discovered, would the guests have eaten meat for dinner? Which I think is fun to think of that you have this scene of a bull 
you know, sacrificial bowl leading out and what are you actually eating and consuming in that moment? Um, and yeah, sure. I think meat was obviously a, you'd have it for special events or it would be more of a, you wouldn't have it every day, but the home that this mosaic was found in was quite luxurious. So we can assume they definitely ate meat for dinner and maybe saw some parallel between the food they were consuming and the sacrificial bowl in the mosaic. Um, yes. Yeah. The, um, Sorry, I was just reading questions. Sorry, Nicole, could you repeat that? Oh, yeah. Bit? Oh, no, just I think I like the idea of how are the people who are enjoying this mosaic in a dining room context, even though it's so violent and bloody, they're also like, it reminds me of this, the Skiffos with Achilles licking his blade and the meat there and Absolutely, all yeah. kind of ideas maybe would have been present for the ancient viewer too. Yeah, there, that relates to another question here by... Uh, Judy uh, Rosenzweig, uh, that is the sacrificial bowl typical or was this an important bout so the prize was more significant? Uh, so relating more specifically to the aspect of the bowl, uh, this relates to a fact about the ancient world that meat eating was just simply not as frequent as it is today, right? With, especially with a typical American diet. Um, so that uh, when there was a sacrifice, the fact of being able to participate to, to eat the meat of the sacrificial victim was a very unique occasion both in ancient Greek and also in Roman times as well. Um, and so, uh, so it, the, the fact of a sacrificial bull is not unique to the dairies and Intellicene, but it is unique to athletic practice uh, because meat was such a rare commodity. It really was a prestige good in that, in that regard. It was something that you did not get to have every day. And that's perhaps why uh, it's associated with uh, athletics, both in the Greek and the Roman period. So yeah, unlike uh, modern athletes, they were not eating pounds of uh, meat a day, although we do have some accounts of that as well. And yeah, we have, um, I just wanted to, I'm thinking of so many things, but this so many questions came in. Another question about domestic artworks from an anonymous attendee, what kinds of domestic artworks might have had wrestler or boxer scenes? Are these scenes also part of any public images? So Getty's, I think you mean just accessible, but the Getty images are all public and I, want to say boxing, the, the spaces, gymnasia, baths, you often get scenes of boxers. Those can be more connected to the real world boxing practice, what Charles was talking about. Um, whereas in domestic, so, but you're asking about domestic, it's not as common. Sometimes you have like North Africa, there's a mosaic showing a boxing match and it seems, or at various arena sports, uh, animal hunts and all sorts of things like that, that seem to connect to the sponsorship of the homeowner. So, um, in that sense, yes, but they're definitely more common in these bath contexts, I'd say. And again, the rare, the Virgil is pretty rare in general. Um, yeah. And oh, and sorry, speaking of the prize, as I want to mention that mm -hmm. the, there was also a second place prize. So Darius, even though he lost, he won a helmet and a sword or something. So Aeneas announces all the prizes, but yes, the bull is definitely the, the prime prize. Right, yeah. There's another question sort of related to the brutality of ancient boxing here from uh, Jean-Manuel uh, Robineau. Uh, the first question uh, is related to the brutality. Uh, Jean-Manuel makes a good point, but we know less than 10 boxers killed in competition uh, for the whole of antiquity, which is very little co considering the amount of ancient documents we have. How do you understand that? So this actually relates to a problem uh, about documentation of ancient athletics in general. Uh, I've actually, with Susan Stevens uh, from uh, Stanford, we're at, we actually are in the process of publishing a new source book on ancient athletics. And the fact is that most of our documentation on athletics comes from literary sources um, rather than, uh, you know, and, and there's some, of course, epigraphic inscriptions and things like that. But this creates a basic problem because uh, there was the practice of sport versus when it was spoken about. And because it was a common cultural practice, uh, the fact is that our knowledge is very limited. And what we have is seen through a sort of lens of literature, really. And this is probably why we don't have that many accounts of uh, the death of particular boxers in the ancient world. I'm sure there were far more than what we do have, because the ones we do have are usually somehow connected to literary themes or philosophers are talking about it. Uh, and there's some epigraphy as well. So, um, so the fact of documentation is, is simply a problem of the evidence around ancient athletics that we have to do a lot of reconstruction because our sources are mainly literary. Uh, and then the second question uh, that Jean-Manuel had is that 
Sometimes a judge can end a match prematurely. Do we have any evidence of that procedure? And what's interesting actually, as far as I can tell, is most of those cases uh, are actually uh, literary cases. So of course, there's a famous account of this, uh, of, of these things ending prematurely, not boxing, but wrestling in the case of the funeral games of Patroclus. Uh, and it was uh, there, Achilles uh, ends the match prematurely. And I think Virgil's Aeneid is actually modeled on that. So that's a sort of literary account. We do have some accounts where uh, there would have to be a tie and there would sort of, you go one blow for blow and, um, and different things like that. So not a whole lot of evidence of umpires stopping fights. Uh, again, uh, so much as them either ending by one, uh, one person quitting or by knockout essentially, or being incapacitated, but yeah. And I'm, well, I'm conscious of our time, so I will answer a few more questions. There's some great ones that just came in. A few people have asked Valerie and another above uh, about uh, the border. And actually I've focused so much on the scene. I just want to briefly mention that yes, this has this kind of elaborate guilloche border with tendrils and the pattern, the chevron pattern. And um, there's a whole studies on this, but basically it's functioning both as this, this seen from Virgil, but also it's a floor decoration. And those patterns are very much tied to mosaics, mosaic floors as, if you think of how mosaic floors function today, if you go to uh, spaces where they're decorated with elaborate floors, they're often patterned in ways and a lot of theory about how this might have encouraged movement through the room. So, um, and you can see behind me, the other mosaics and how they have these fabulous borders that would have both bracketed the main colorful scene, but then also maybe encourage you to walk around and see it from different angles. So, and yeah, there's lots of to say on that. And I think people, yeah, workshops would specialize in certain border elements. And um, I think that's an interesting point of how it was received in a domestic context. And, it was, and then speaking of the owner and how this, I wanna just answer some anonymous question. Someone asked, does the scene make some kind of claim for the owner about home turf? And if you're hinting at the fact that Entelus, the local Sicilian, wins the match and kind of stands triumphant over this new tro Trojan Dares. I think that is kind of a fun uh, interpretation. We don't know, but that could be one way it could be interpreted of as the homeowner, this is my home and kind of statement about this being, you know, you're welcome to my home, but also this is my home. <laughs> um, yeah. Great. There's another good question here. Um, a lot of great questions. Yeah, we'll certainly not be able to get to all of them. But uh, a question about cannibalism said, I mentioned cannibalism with the licking of the bloody knife uh, used on Hector. What are other examples? Uh, in the ancient world, it's very interesting because, and especially with mythology um, and poetry, cannibalism is always implied, but it's still understood as a major taboo, right? And I think that was another comment by one, somebody else in there about cannibalism being one of the greatest taboos, right? of course, according to Levi-Strauss. Um, and in the case of Achilles, of course, what he says in the Iliad, he says, I would eat your flesh raw if I could. So he doesn't, he doesn't actually, he gives the desire for cannibalism, but he never will actually participate in it. And there's always that implication, but never the actualization of it. Um, we do have other cases. So of course, with the Olympics, there's the story of Pelops, who was uh, in one account, uh, his father Tantalus actually cuts him up and serves uh, Pelops to the gods. Uh, and Pelops is one of the founders of the Olympic games and all the gods and Demeter is one that accidentally takes a bite out of uh, Pelops, uh, his shoulder. They put Pelops back together and he has an ivory shoulder. So Demeter accidentally participates in a form of cannibalism as well. So it's understood as one of these greatest taboos. And so I think the Greek accounts are sort of playing with that taboo, giving an expression to that desire, but never actualizing it. Right. So and I think that's what's so fascinating, of course, that's what fascinates me about the Mike Tyson episode. Right. Is it's one thing to say, you know, I want his heart. I'll eat his children. But then it goes a step further and he actually takes a bite right out of his opponent. So that's the sort of step beyond the desire for cannibalism, that that sort of inherent desire that goes across both ancient and modern and the actual commitment of it. Yeah. Oh, boy. And yeah, the, that extreme violence, and he doesn't actually, yeah, he doesn't actually eat it, he doesn't commit cannibalism, but it's definitely there in the Tyson quote. And I realized we were running up against time. So I think we'll, yeah. this has been so great. Um, thank you so much, Charles, for all of your insights on the ancient world and athletics. 
And for all those questions that we still haven't had time to answer, we will get to them and try and respond to them. But also, this presentation will be available online. Um, let me just. <laughs> so yes, thank you again right. for joining thank us. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. And yeah, thank you to all our attendees. And um, come visit us at the villa or see us on Art Break in the next programs. And uh, have a great afternoon. So thanks all. Bye bye.